The first law of thermodynamics says that the energy of the universe is conserved, so energy cannot be destroyed. We would say that the mass energy, but in general, energy cannot be destroyed. So if we study a system, and that system could be a beaker where a reaction is taking place, we have seen that the energy, the system can either lose energy or gain energy, and that's because it has exchanged energy with the surroundings. So this, the energy of the universe, in, in this sense, is constant, and we have used, when expressing the energy of a, of of our system, the, the, the term enthalpy. Enthalpy is very similar to the internal energy and we have said that when our system loses energy we call that exothermic and that can be measured by measuring the heat that that system kicks out to the surroundings or contrary when the system gains energy we call that endothermic and typically it's because the system has gained heat from the surroundings. That's the first law of thermodynamics, the conservation of energy. We know how to calculate enthalpy changes for for reactions and and that's fine. However, we want to now understand what motivates changes in nature. Why is it that well, exothermic and endothermic both happen in nature. So what is it that some reactions or any kind of process in general uh, motivates that, uh, that to, to take place unlike others that do not take place? So what is it that promotes change in the universe? So first of all, uh, I want you to realize that we already, the human mind already knows how to distinguish things that happen from things that do not happen. So we already have in our brains a sense of the second law of thermodynamics. You can see in these two pictures clearly that there is one picture moving forward and there is one picture moving backward. In both cases the energy is conserved. However, you can distinguish one from in which the time is moving forward, this one, and this one is the time being moving backward. So let's try to analyze that inherent intuition that we have but now at the molecular level. For example, in this case you have again <coughs> excuse me, two pictures, one clearly moving forward, the other one clearly moving backward. If you see in the picture on the right there is gases uh, leaving a gas, sorry, leaving a container. On the other hand the picture on the left is actually gases seeming they look like they're agreeing on all of them moving at the same time inside. This clearly happens, this clearly does not happen. So, let me just say, does not happen, or at least it has been reversed. In the sense, this is why we say that the second law of thermodynamics is the arrow of time. It will tell us in what direction time is going to move forward. Uh, this was a case for gas expansion. Another very well-known example is the case of osmosis or osmotic pressure. The tendency for a, a solute to move across a membrane so that the concentrations on both sides of the membrane are equivalent. As you can see in the picture on the left, the time is moving forward. So this sense of uh, of time moving forward that we have, uh, we will try to describe it more quantitatively. To do that, uh, we are going to try to understand what is it that we see in molecules that makes us realize what picture is moving forward, what picture is moving backward. In this case, however, notice that there's just two molecules. This would be a SN2 reaction, and you may have a hard time realizing which one is the one moving forward and which one is the one moving backward. They are pretty much indistinguishable. So we actually need to add more than one molecule to see, and in this case this is an explosion, this could perfectly be this reaction. Um, notice that in the picture on the right there is more than one molecule and we can clearly see, sorry, the picture on the left, we can clearly see that that picture, that movie is moving forward. On the other hand, in the r picture on the right, there's something weird happening. It looks like all the energy is being cons 
concentrated in a specific points. That clearly does not happen. So the second law of thermodynamics, whatever that is, is something that only happens when we consider the bulk of molecules. Remember that in, when we ju were just considering one or two molecules, we were not able to distinguish what moves forward and what, and what moves backward. So it has to be something that works on the average. And as you can already guess, it's, it seems like nature tends to spread. Being particles or being energy, there is, for the sake of probability, as you will see in a minute, that nature tends to change towards a states of where uh, states of higher distribution of energy and particles. That's, so let's try to give you another example and, and we will have to come up with a magnitude called entropy with that. So um, let me play this simulation here. In this case we have a hundred particles on the left and none on the right. And if I play here and I suddenly withdraw the separator, notice what happens. We started with 100 and 0, now we have 70-something, 20-something, and if we were to stare at this simulation long enough, now it's already 60-40, you can bel believe me that the simulation will reach a point where it's 50-50, or more or less, oscillating around 50-50. We're not going to stare at it for a while, but we will try to remember the simulation to answer some questions. So. What is the driving force that makes even out the number of particles on both sides? Notice that there is, it's not repulsion. It, there is nothing that, if you were looking at the molecules, there's not, molecules uh, can collide with each other without much repulsion. It just seems to be this tendency to spread. Okay, so um, what lies behind this tendency to spread is only exclusive, exclusively a probability factor. In other words, the tendency for nature to change towards a state where there is a higher distribution of particles and a more spread distribution of energy boils down to the idea that those states are more probable. So let's try to describe that with a little bit of statistics. Let's say that you have just one particle. If I remove the barrier now I have, there's one possibility here, but I've, if I remove the barrier, I have two possibilities. I can put the, the atom on the left or the atom on the right. Now let's say that I have two atoms, and if I remove the barrier, now I have up to four possible combinations. I should remove this one, but if you will, three. But so if I have three, again, I have one combination when the wall is closed versus eight possible combinations. So in that case, um, if I have ten atoms, the possible combinations that I can arrange equivalently the molecules is two to the ten. That is a thousand, more than a thousand. And if after all I have one mole of atoms, the number of combinations is two to the Avogadro's number. So that's a large number. So when we're trying to answer this question, what is the probability for a hundred particles to move to one single container? It was one probability over how many combinations? Two to the hundred. So the driving force that moves particles to spread is because it's more probable. The probability to have the hundred particles in this simulation, all of them in one single container, is this little. And if we have the number of moles uh, if you have the number of mole of particles, it, the probability is even smaller. So again, this is what the second law of thermodynamics tell us, that there is a tendency for, to, for nature to spread to states that are more probable. And those, probab those more probable states typically imply a more spread of particles or a more spread sense of energy. So what is it that we can use to quantify this spread of particles and energy, the magnitude is called entropy. Entropy is equal to a constant, and this is called the Boltzmann constant, times the logarithm 
and W is the possible number of rearrangements in, in our case that was 2 to the Avogadro's number, as you can imagine, that's a very large. Um, so the larger the number of states that you can arrange your system, the larger the entropy will be. And that's what we will use to exemplify the direction of some processes. K is the Bo is Boltzmann constant, is very small, with uh, something a little bit fun, is that Avogadro's number times the constant, the Boltzmann constant is equal to the ideal gas law gas constant. So it's it may be easier to remember this way. So this magnitude entropy, unlike energy, so unlike the first law of thermodynamics in which we said that energy is constant, entropy is not constant. Entropy increases with the number of energetically equivalent ways of arranging a component and that is described with this letter W. This is fairly abstract. We will not do much, a lot of exercises in this sense. Notice that we would need a little bit of statistics to actually calculate this W for different examples, but this will give you a molecular detail of what entropy is about. Entropy is measuring how spread particles are or how spread energy is. The higher the spread of energy and particles, the better. So we can formulate the second law of thermodynamics saying that the entropy of the universe always increases. So since the beginning of time, any change that has happened in nature has been translated into an increase of entropy, either because of the system or the surroundings, but entropy is constantly increasing. We will see more specific examples in the next videos, but uh, this is at least the theory that we will try to understand when we apply it to specific examples.